you know it's a bad day when you get called into the manager's office on a Friday at four o'clock. You, you got to know something is happening, right? You, you got to you've got to understand that uh, your time at the company is 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 limited uh, to say the least. Typically, those conversations Fridays at four o'clock are uh, you're no longer going to work for our company. Your services are, are no longer needed here. And I've found myself in that position. I don't know if you have, but just a word to the wise. If you if you have a meeting at four o'clock on a Friday with a manager that they didn't tell you about, it's probably not a good time. Uh, and, and that's where we find ourselves in in this series of detours and delays in chapter 40 today. See, we've got a couple of guys who, well, they got to go to the manager's office. And the problem is, the manager, he runs the entire country. It's Pharaoh. And you are his most trusted aides. These, these guys are the most trusted aides next to Pharaoh. They, they have unlimited access to the guy. There is complete trust with this guy. And so if things go wrong, if things aren't going according to plan, if Pharaoh gets sick because of something he ate, you got to know that, that your job is on the line. Not just your job, but your entire life. Everything you've lived for, everything you've worked for is about to be destroyed. There, there comes a death sentence if Pharaoh gets sick. See, if you're the cupbearer, and the baker for Pharaoh, that has a lot of responsibility. You're, you're close to him. And in the leisurely time, when he's having dinner, when he's having breakfast, during the meals, late in the evening, that, that midnight snack, uh, you're in charge of that. You are the cupbearer. You make sure that the wine is good, the drinks are good, that there's no poison in it. If you're the baker, that means you're in control of all the food, making sure that it's good when it goes out to Pharaoh. Because there's some people that might want to hurt the guy. And so if you fail at your job, you're on the hook for some pretty drastic things. And all we can gather from that is that we've got a, a baker and a cupbearer who are on the wrong end of Pharaoh's punishment because something apparently has happened to the Pharaoh to a point where, where he has had to do something to the cupbearer and the baker. One of them is at fault, and he's not sure who, so you're just going to punish both of them. It's like when you have kids, and, 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 and you know somebody did something wrong. Nobody's fessing up to it, so you're just going to punish everyone. That's where we find ourselves here in chapter 40 of Detours and Delays. And we're going to see how God has orchestrated this whole thing by his divine providence. We're going to get to next week uh, on, on Joseph, on the story of Joseph, on this thing of redemption and, and, and how that all plays together. But there's a couple of guys who have to go through some stuff in order to let the story continue to play out. And so if you have a flat screen with you, if you're not driving, uh, we would love for you to open up that flat screen to Genesis chapter 40. Or if you've got a physical Bible, we love when people bring their Bibles. We want to encourage people to bring their Bibles to whatever it is they're doing. If you're just watching this at home, pause me, go get, go get your Bible, get some snacks, settle in, get that comfy spot on the couch, whatever it is that you're, like if you're still in your pajamas, that's awesome. Just get comfortable, but make sure you have your Bible. It's so good. You can underline stuff. You can, you can read through, you can make notes of things. Like be, be okay with writing in your Bible. Like it, it's okay for you to write in your Bible as long as you're writing good things, you know? Um, it's okay to do those things. And so I encourage you to get your Bible out and read along with me as we start, continue our series, not start, continue our series in Detours and Delay. We're catching up on, on Joseph. We know that he's been thrown in prison. Last week he got thrown in prison uh, th from, from Potiphar for something that he didn't do. He was falsely accused of, of sexual assault, basically, of Potiphar's wife. And Potiphar had no choice but to throw Joseph in jail. And so here we come. Uh, it's right on the heels of that. So let's get going. Verse one, sometime after this, I'm stop right there. 
I'm just going to stop right there. Sometime after this. Oh, don't you hate those sometimes after this moments? Like the, that gap between, between when Joseph is thrown in jail and now. Like what is going on in that sometime after this? He's been in jail. We don't know how long. It's just been some time. Man, it, it stinks not having all the answers, doesn't it? It stinks after having to just wait on God for things and say, well, at some point he's going to come through. And, and, and we look back at our life and be like, oh, the sometime after this, that, that was, that was a, a dark time. But man, did I have so much growth. In that one little statement, sometime after this, What's God doing in, in those quiet moments, in the, in the moments where we don't think we're hearing from him? We're not, we're not sure. We're just stuck here. What are we doing? Are we just twiddling our thumbs, hoping something happens? Or are we proactively uh, continuing to move forward, studying, reading his word? Like, what are we doing in the sometime after this moments? Mm. Boy, we're not even four words in yet. Okay. Sometime after this, the cupbearer of the king of Egypt and his baker committed an offense against their lord, the king of Egypt. That's a problem. And Pharaoh was angry with his two officers and the chief cupbearer and the chief baker. And he put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard in the prison where Joseph was confined. It doesn't say what happened here. It doesn't say what they did. It just says that there was an offense against their Lord, the king of Egypt. And if you're going to have an offense against someone, you probably don't want it to be against the king of Egypt. You probably don't want it to be against Pharaoh because he's got a lot of power. You know, he's, he's, he's got the type of power where he can put you uh, where no one's going to find you and no one's going to say a word because that's Pharaoh, right? They did something. I don't know. Maybe the baker put too much salt in it, and, and, and he was like on a no-salt diet. I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. He did something. Uh, they did something that wasn't, wasn't up to snuff. And so Pharaoh puts them in prison, and it just so happens that he puts them in the same prison of the captain of the guard, which would have been, again, probably Potiphar, in the prison where Joseph was confined. It just so happens that they're in the exact same place as Joseph. And I love those just so happens moments. I don't really like the sometime moments, like the, the in-between moments, like when nothing's going on, how do we continue to do that? But I do love the just so happens moments where, where two different stories finally just intersect. You know, it, it just so happened when, when I was in high school at a, at a youth retreat. It just so happens that I knew a youth pastor from a different church, and it just so happened that I saw him at the time that I did. And it just so happened that my now wife noticed me talking to the youth pastor and came up. It just so happens that we got to be at the same place at the same time, and now here we are. Those just so happens moments are never just so happens. That's never a coincidence. God has purpose behind every single moment. Every single moment is ripe with God's purpose. It's, it's, it's exciting. And here we find Joseph just so happens to be in the same room now, confined in prison, as two of the people who were most trusted with Pharaoh, that were closest to Pharaoh. That's going to be important for later on, like maybe next chapter. You'll just have to come back next week. Verse 4, the captain of the guard appointed Joseph to be with them, and he attended them. They continued for some time in custody. And one night... They both dreamed, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were confined in prison, each his own dream, and each dream with its own interpretation. When Joseph came to them in the morning, he saw that they were troubled. So he asked Pharaoh's officers who were with him in custody in his master's house, Why are your faces downcast today? Okay, we're going to stop again right there, because we get to see another, we get to peel back the layer uh, a couple more layers of, of Joseph here. We get to see his character. We get to see a little bit more of his character, of our good pal Joe here uh, in, in these verses. So it says that uh, the captain of the guard, which again could have been Potiphar, appointed Joseph to be with them. And he attended them. When it says that he attended them, it means that he, he served them. 
And they continued for some time in his custody. They were in Joseph's care and he was serving them. Now Joseph had every single right. Later on it says that he came into them one morning. He saw that they were troubled. He saw that they were sad. And so he asked what was going on. Hey, why are you so sad today? Now this is a great moment for us to really look at the life of Joseph and really see what sets him apart. Again, as Potiphar noticed it uh, in the chapter before, that he was a man of God, that, he, that God was with him. Here we have another little glimpse of maybe why that is. Joseph is a man of character and he's thinking about other people. This is a time where if if this had happened to anybody else, if this had happened to any of the brothers, if this had happened to you or me, we are very unlike Joseph, I believe, because if this had happened to us, if we are thrown in prison because of nothing we did wrong, we're accused falsely of something, we are never going to stop talking about the fact that we are in there against our will, obviously, because we didn't do anything wrong. We're going to tell every single person that we come across that, hey, I didn't do anything wrong. Now, I've heard in prison, everybody is innocent. Nobody has actually ever done anything wrong in prison. Everybody is there falsely. But for some people that are are actually there falsely, you would never stop talking about how you shouldn't be there. You didn't commit this crime. How is it that like you're trying to get pity on yourself and, and have other people feel sorry for you? And we don't see an ounce of that with, with Joe here. All we see is people coming under his care and him tending to their needs, serving them. He's putting aside all of the things that he's got going on in his life, all the the terrible things that have happened to him. He's been thrown into a pit by his brothers. His brothers hated him. Then he got sold into slavery. He had a good job uh, as a slave under Potiphar, as good a job as you can have. Then gets falsely accused of rape and now is thrown back into a pit, into prison. If anybody has a right to complain, it's Joseph, but he doesn't mutter a word. He focuses on the needs of other people. And I think sometimes we need to shut up (laughs) about what's going on in our lives. I get it. Life is hard. Focus on somebody else though. Let's take an example out of Joseph here and see that he has done nothing wrong. He's put in this prison, um, has done nothing wrong, and he's still only caring about other people around him. I think that's a lesson for you and me. So these guys have a dream and 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 they're they're sad about it. So let's see why. Verse 8. They said to him, "We have had dreams and there is no one to interpret them." And Joseph said to them, "Do not interpretations belong to God? Please tell them to me." See, Joseph has a little bit of experience in dreams, right? He's, he's had a couple of dreams himself that he's been able to interpret because of God. Now, we have to make this delineation here. Spiritual things belong to God. The spiritual things belong to God. Listen to what he says. Do not interpretations belong to God. Please tell them to me. He's not saying that he's going to be the one who interprets the dreams. He's not saying that he can ha- has any power over this. At this time, there's a lot of people that you could pay and have them interpret their dreams. Now, you could, you could, they would use different things like uh, things of the time, whatever it was, like symbols that they were very relevant to uh, to this culture at this time, and they could interpret a dream based on the information given to them, based on their job, based on how they act, based on what they do, uh, based on the culture at the time of uh, th- these dream interpreters that you would pay money to could interpret a dream for you based on just what you offer them. And so these guys are sad because they're in prison and they can't find one of these dream interpreters. And, and this is where Joseph is different. And he says, don't interpretations belong to God? I'm, I'm one with God. Maybe in, those, in that moment of, of after some time moment, maybe he spent some, some of that time really devoting himself more to God because, I mean, what else are you going to do in those times? What else, what else is there to do in those times outside of just, you know, spending time with God? If you're in prison, you don't have much of a choice of, of what you can do. And so maybe he spent that time uh, drawing closer to Christ, drawing closer to God at this time. And so he's like, I I can interpret the dream for you because it belongs to God and so do I. And so he can speak to me. He has this gift of interpreting dreams. And we have to remember that the spiritual things belong to God. In this day and age, we're very new agey and we like to use whatever terminology we can. Oh, like uh, I I just felt it in my essence. Essence is a big word for people who are um, 
very spiritual people of the world today. They're, they're like, your essence is, 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 is troubling me. Or, or, you know, listen to nature, listen to the trees, listen to whatever. It's like, no, man, the, the, the spiritual things belong to God. They don't belong to our essence. They don't belong to the trees. They don't belong to our, uh, the, the, the earth, to mother earth, whatever it is that like, we, we come up with all of these things that take the focus off God and, and onto ourselves and the things around us. We start celebrating creation more than the creator and think that creation is the holder of the spiritual things, but God is the holder of spiritual things. Not us, not the trees, not our essences. It's only God that the spiritual things belong to. And he invites us into that. And that's a good distinction, that that we're invited into the spiritual realm with Jesus, with God. Everything else is, honestly, it's from the enemy. When we start talking about the essence of our, ourselves and, and our spirits and, 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 and nature and like whatever those, those words are, like, um, you know, the, like you're a spiritual being, whatever, like I just think that that is, is not grounded in scripture. It's, it's from the enemy. It's taking our focus off of God and onto ourselves. And I think we need to be careful of that with spiritual things, especially with stuff like this, with dreams and all that kind of stuff. Let's keep going. Verse nine, so the chief cupbearer told his dream to Joseph and said to him, in my dream, there was a vine before me. And on the vine, there were three branches. As soon as it budded, its its blossom shot forth and the clusters ripened into grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. Then Joseph said to him, this is the interpretation. The three branches are three days. In three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your office. And you shall place Pharaoh's cup in his hand as formerly when you were his cupbearer. So he has some good news here. Joseph has some good news for the cupbearer saying, he's going to put you back into the position. In three days, Pharaoh's going to need you and he's going to put you back in this position of power. He's using the gifting that he has from God, his spiritual gifting to interpret this dream and uses it for others. And God speaking in dreams is very rare. So I want to I wanna just bring this up as well, that, that just because you have a dream at night doesn't mean that it's necessarily from God. Okay, you could have had bad pizza some night and, and had a, a, a bad dream, had a dream about, you know, something like this. And we're like, oh, that must be from God. We have to be careful. Dreams are used so very scarcely in the Old Testament. And in the New Testament, any, anywhere in Scripture, dreams are, are, are so rarely used that <clears throat> I, I don't think we can get a lot of theology from, from, from this passage as far as it concerns dreams. Okay? Dreams, we would love to think that our dreams have super deep meaning and that we need to really connect with our dreams and we really need to just, oh, what's this mean? What's the interpretation here? Sometimes, very rarely, I would say, that can, that can, it's an exception to the rule. The rule is dreams are dreams based on what your surroundings are, what you did that day. One time I had a dream that um, I was uh, sleeping and, and I was using, um, at the time, I was using a pillowcase, or not a pillowcase, I was using a sleeping bag as a pillow, and I had a small blanket, and my dream was I was on a very hard service and I couldn't get comfortable. Well, the dream was very based in reality in that I was sleeping on the ground, and I was using a sleeping bag as a pillow. It wasn't very comfortable, and so there we are. Like, you have a dream where, uh, <laughs> never mind, we're, we're not going to go there. I was going to talk about peeing in the bed, but we're not. I don't know why I would do that. Uh, dreams are based in reality, things that have happened to us throughout the day. And the danger is that we, like, this is, we can get into, like, the, the, the super sexy gifts, right? Like, speaking in tongues, prophecy, like, uh, teaching, um, some, some of these spiritual gifts that, that we would really love to have, and, and they seem like they take center stage, and dreams is one of these things where um, 
we would love to be able to interpret them and be able to just like, wow, that guy's so wise, so spiritual. We're so obsessed with things that seem spiritual. But dreams are, are very few and far between of actually meaning much of anything. Now, there are instances where this happens, especially in, in Muslim communities where they don't have good access to the scriptures. There's reports, and, and I don't know how true these are. I don't, I, I can't, it's hard to corroborate things on the internet, right? Um, I know that this happens from time to time, that uh, someone, especially from a different faith, from a different uh, part of the world where, where access to the Bible is very limited, will have dreams that Jesus shows up in and show them the way. That's happened. There's stories out there. If you want to look it up, just be careful. Just, just be, I just want to say be careful. Okay, and then when it comes to interpreting them, I was already talking about spiritual gifts and using these spiritual gifts. Um, we have this idea that that everyone should have the same spiritual gifts, that everyone should be able to speak in tongues. Maybe you were raised that way, that like everyone should should be able to speak in tongues. Everyone should be able to prophecy. Everyone should be able to do this. It's more in the charismatic movements. And if if you've come from that, I I don't find that in scripture. But what I do see is that we're supposed to use your spiritual gifts to serve God and others, to serve God and others. We we. And, and, and we gravitate towards the, like, what we would consider the super spiritual gifts, right? Uh, like I said, prophecy, tongues, like apostolic ministry, um, teaching, like we can, we can consider these things all like, oh man, that, that must be a really spiritual person because of the spiritual gift that they have. And it, that's not the case. Every spiritual gift is used for the purpose of serving God and serving others. If we ever use them for ourselves, to bring ourselves up, to puff ourselves up, we're using them in the wrong case. And some of us may be like, I don't even know what you're talking about when you talk about spiritual gifts. We're all given spiritual gifts. You can look it up in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. There's a list of spiritual gifts. It's not an exhaustive list. You can also find it in Romans, I forget what chapter, and also in Ephesians. Uh, there's these different gifts that are given to believers um, that we use to serve God and others. And that's what Joseph is doing. He has this gift of interpreting dreams, which could be a prophetic um, a way of, of a spiritual gift, and he's using it to serve God and serve others. If you don't know what your spiritual gift is, you can go to a website called uh, spiritual gifts, excuse me, spiritualgiftstest.com. And uh, you can fill it out as it is with most things. Like you can manipulate it to, to make it be whatever spiritual gift you think you want to have. Um, so I would just say use it uh, again with apprehension and try to answer those questions uh, truthfully as, as best you can because um, we, we can get it wrong. We can desire a different spiritual gift and or not desire a spiritual gift, like the, maybe the spiritual gift of, of giving. Um, we could be like, yeah, I don't think I have that spiritual gift. I just, I, you know, I, so for some reason, I just don't think I have the spiritual gift of, of giving. It's like, no, I think you do, uh, but you just don't want to use it. So there's, there's spiritual gifts. Um, and I want to read in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 27, it says, Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the higher gifts, and I will show you a still more excellent way. So Paul is here, he, he's writing to the church in Corinth that uh, not everyone is going to have the same gifting. Like I said, some of us have been brought up in a way that like everyone, if you are truly saved, if you've had the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that you will now be able to speak in tongues. Uh, and, and that is a symbol of your salvation. And that's not true that it's just it's just not true not everyone is going to have the same gifting and we always want to gravitate to the big ones right and be like oh man boy that person was able to speak in tongues and 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 the danger in that is that then we elevate that gift more than the other one like some people are are gifted in in serving 
And that's their spiritual gift. And we're like, oh, they're just serving. It's not that big of a, did you see that person? Did you see that person give that spiritual gift of, of tongues? Holy cow, man, they must have such a close relationship with Jesus. And we start to delineate who's more favored and who's less favored. And again, that's from the enemy. Spiritual gifts are for everyone, but not everyone has every single spiritual gift. Some of us just don't have the spiritual gift of discernment. Some of us don't have the spiritual gift of teaching. Some of us don't have the spiritual gift of, of speaking in tongues. Most don't. So just let's remember that moving forward. Like your spiritual gift is your spiritual gift and it's good for you to serve God and serve others with that spiritual gift gift, whatever it is that God has for you. And just be confident in that. All right, so Joseph uses his spiritual gift to serve God and serve others. Now let's see what happens. Verse 14, he says, only remember me when it is well with you, and please do me the kindness to mention me to Pharaoh, and so get me out of this house. House. For I was indeed stolen out of the land of the Hebrews, and here also I have done nothing, but they should put me into the pit. So here he is. Joseph now is like, listen, you're going to get out of prison. When you do, when you're with Pharaoh, please remember me and let him know what I've done for you, that I'm here on false pretenses. There's nothing wrong with wanting to get out of a circumstance that you're in. Just because God is with you in every circumstance doesn't mean you need to stay in every circumstance, right? Just because God is with you in that circumstance doesn't mean that you're supposed to stay there. Like, we're not masochists where it's like, no, I need to stay in my suffering and just, you know, let the Lord do his thing and, and, and soon enough I'll be out of it. We can find ways out of it. And if it's good to God, then we'll get out of it. He's, he's, he's pleading <laughs> with the, with the, uh, uh, with the cupbearer to say, please remember me when you get, cause I don't want to stay here. Like I've got things that I want to do. Imagine, okay, well, this is a silly one, but just, just Im- imagine, uh, if uh, like, like back on the Titanic, like w- when it was sinking, people weren't just sticking around because God was there, right? Like he, they, they were on the boat, they're on the Titanic and they weren't like, huh, what a weird circumstance that I find myself in. Myself in. God must want me to stay here on the boat and not try to get off of it because that's where I'm at, so I might as well stay here. No, people wanted to get off the Titanic because it was sinking and they were going to die. Joseph doesn't want to stay in prison, and if it's good for him to be able to get out, if it's good for God to let him out, then he's going to take advantage of that, and he's going to do that. If there's a lifeboat waiting for you, you don't just pass it up and be like, no, nope, I'm supposed to be here here it's it's get on the boat (laughs) right get on the boat you don't have to stay in every single circumstance so many of us are like ah man i guess i should just be in this i we we feel like we have to stay in 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 this this place of just agony and pain because that's what god would have us do And, and i just think that's wrong God called to give us an abundant life. Not that we wouldn't have temptations and trials and things going our way, but he called us to give an abundant life so that we would be happy and joyful with, with him. And it's not based on the things that we have, but it's based in him and, and, and this abundant life. If we're connected to him, then that's great. That's how it should be. We get our joy from him. It doesn't mean, though, that just because we have our joy in him that we have to live in, in a swamp and, 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 and never have anything good happen to us. It's like, no, I, I can tell that I'm blessed by God because bad things keep happening to me. Well, maybe, but maybe you're just not living your life very well. Like, you're not taking care of yourself. Like, it's the same people that, that will say, like, if they get a diagnosis of some kind, be like, well, 
God told me, or uh, like God can heal me and, and, and won't take any medicine whatsoever. They're like, we believe God's going to take care of this. And then they die because they don't get any medicine. It's like God made doctors. He made medicine. <laughs> he made modern medicine so that you could take care of that cold that you had or, or, or the flu or whatever. It's like, man, so many times we, we, we think that we don't have to do anything and try to get out of whatever situation we're in. With the things around us, God is like, you idiot. I had, I, like, I gave you so many opportunities. So Joseph is just saying, hey, this is an opportunity for me to get out of prison. I don't want to stay in prison. I know God is with me in prison. God would also be with me out of prison. I'm pretty sure. So if I have an opportunity to get out, I'm going to get out. If God's giving you an opportunity to go to the next thing, d- Go to the next thing. If it doesn't work out, then you weren't supposed to go that way. But you can at least try. Right? Sometimes we use that as a thing of laziness. All right, let's, let's, let's just keep going. Verse, uh, verse 16. When the chief baker saw that the interpre- interpretation was favorable, he said to Joseph, I also had a dream. There were three cake baskets on my head. In the uppermost basket, there were all sorts of baked food for Pharaoh, but the birds were eating it out of the basket on my head. So he's got this dream that he's got. Uh, uh, um, the baker does. The chief baker is like, hey, his dream turned out okay. I think I'm going to give my dream now. Like It's like uh, Monty Python where, where they have to um, cross the bridge and, the, and they have to answer three questions. Like, what is your favorite color? Uh, I forget what the three questions are. They're all super easy, right? What is your quest to seek the Holy Grail? What um, is your name? And what is your favorite color? And like, okay, go. You can go ahead. And so like the first guy goes like, oh, that was easy. So the next guy has all the confidence in the world. <laughs> it's like, uh, what is your name? What is your quest? What's the airspeed velocity of an unmade swallow? And the guy's like, oh, I don't know. And he gets thrown into the pit, right? It's like, oh, confidence. And then, and then failure. That's, that's what this reminds me of. And Joseph answered and said, this is its interpretation. I just, <laughs> you do realize I pre-thought that out because there is a gap between those two verses and I took time to tell you about Monty Python and what that meant to me. So eh, just I wanted to let you know that that was planned out. Sometimes I don't plan things out. That one was planned out. And Joseph answered and said, This is the interpretation. The three baskets are three days. In three day or, days, Pharaoh will lift up your head from you (laughs) and hang you on a tree and the birds will eat the flesh from you. So Joe, he kind of has a little bit of fun with this, it seems like, and he does a little play on words. He's like, in three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head. He said the same thing to the cupbearer. Hey, Pharaoh's going to lift up your head. You're going to be brought back to your your place that you were at before. Then to the baker, he says, "Uh, in three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head. And I'm sure the the baker is like, from you. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> just like your face turns pale because you get some bad news and hang you on a tree. He's basically saying you're going to be decapitated and then they're going to hang you out as a public display of what happens to somebody who does something against the uh, does something against Pharaoh. And then the birds are going to eat the flesh from you. Like the, this is a pretty gruesome. This is how you're going to die. And it's going to happen in three days. Sorry about you. And that brings up the next point, man. Commit to truth. Even when it's difficult. Commit to truth even when it's difficult. This is a tough thing for me. This is really difficult because I, I, I don't like giving tough truth to people. I don't even like it when somebody has a little bit of food like on their lip or in their beard. I won't tell them because... I don't know why. I have a hard time telling somebody, hey, you've got someone some, something on, on your face. You should probably wipe that off. I'll let it go. I'm just telling you what kind of a person I am. Like, I'm just going to let that go. I'm just going to like, oh, yeah, you do have some of that on your face. And, I'm, and I'll look at it for a while, but I'm never going to tell you about it. I don't, I don't know why I have this stoppage in my brain that's like, no, nah, don't, don't tell them. They don't need to know. But somebody else will tell them. It's fine. We need to commit to truth even when it's difficult. Joseph doesn't shy away from, from this truth. He doesn't shy away from telling uh, the, the baker the, the unfortunate news. 
And I know for me as a preacher, I, w- I much would rather tell you the cupbearer news. Like, hey, yeah, everything's going to be completely fine. And I kind of gloss over the baker news that those of us who are separated from God face eternity in hell. I, I, it's not popular, and it's, it, it, but it's, it's truth. It's found in scripture. And I'm convicted because, man, I want you to like me and I want you to like this church and I want it to grow. And so part of me is like, oh, just let's, let's avoid the, the tougher s- subjects. Let's just avoid the truth of what that is. Maybe they'll get to it later. Maybe somebody else will preach about it, you know? Uh, maybe Clayton will come in and, and, and do that job for me. But it's like, man, we've got to commit to truth even when it's difficult. And so I'm going to practice that a little bit. I got to tell you something. Uh, that's, that's truth um, from my past. I don't tell very many people this, and now I'm telling everyone. Uh, I, I don't even know how to say this, but um, I liked Creed, the band. <laughs> I, I, m- more than that, I saw them in concert twice. I saw Creed in concert twice. And that's a truth that's difficult to say. <laughs> I mean, it's not Nickelback level, but it's still pretty rough, right? We have to commit to truth. No, I know that's kind of stupid and silly, but we have to commit to truth even when it's difficult. And the, and the truth is that, man, God loves you so much that he sent his only son to die on a cross so that we would not perish but have everlasting life. The only way to heaven is through Jesus Christ. The only way is by putting our faith in him. What does that mean for people, other nations of the world? I don't know. I'm not God, but I do know the only way is through his son, Jesus Christ. And those who are separated from him face eternal damnation from God. I'm not the judge. I'm not the jury. I'm, I'm not God. And so I'm going to plead for people to follow Jesus. And that's a difficult truth. Because we would love to believe that just everybody goes. If, if, if everybody goes, then what was the purpose of the cross? If everybody's good, no matter what you believe, no matter what religion you are, no matter how you like, lived your life, it, it, if if that's true, then, then, then why the cross? If there was any other way except through Jesus Christ, then why the cross? Why did he have to bear the cross? Why did he have to bear our sin? Why did he have to bear our shame? The difficult truth is Jesus is the only way. We need to commit to truth, even when it's difficult. On the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, he made a feast for all his servants and lifted up the head of the chief cupbearer and the head of the chief baker among his servants. He restored the chief cupbearer to his position and he placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to them. He didn't f- hang them to die. He, he, they cut off his head and then hung him out probably on a stake, sorry to get gruesome, for, for a, a demonstration for all. So it came true. The dreams came true. Three days later, three days later, it came true. Verse 23, yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. Poor Joe <laughs> is forgotten by man. The chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. Have you ever felt like that? Forgotten? Joe is forgotten by man, but he's not forgotten by God. And in the story, we can look at Joseph and we can say, okay, I, I want to be more like Joseph. Like he uses spiritual gifts well, whatever. Like you can feel pity for him. I, a, a lot of the times though, you guys, we are more like the cupbearer and the baker. We're more like the cupbearer and the baker. Joseph is, is more a Christ-like figure, especially in this part of the story. See, 
Joseph was in prison. He was innocent, in prison. Spoke truth, spoke hard truth, and was proved right three days later. Jesus was and is innocent. And he put himself in a prison of of humankind, so to speak. And he put himself onto a cross. And he said a lot of truth. He gave a lot of truth and he was proved right three days later when he rose up from the grave. And the biggest difference between Joseph and Jesus is Joseph said to, to the to the guilty one, you're gonna die. And that was it, that was the end. Jesus says to us, you're guilty, and that's why I'm here. And that's why I'm here. Jesus lived a perfect life. He was an innocent human, fully God, fully man lived a perfect life, came and died on a cross for us to save us from our sins. And and, and so when we feel like we're forgotten by God, by man, know that we are not and know that we can trust God with the outcome of our lives. We can trust God with the, with the outcome, whatever it is. Even, even when we feel forgotten, trust him for his timing. Trust him for courage. Trust him for the plans, for everything in your life. Trust God with the outcome. We try to make plans and we, and we try to do the best we can to get out of circumstances that we're in. But if it's like, no, if God says, no, you need to stay in that circumstance for a little bit. If we're forgotten about, it's okay because God has a plan. We trust him with the outcome. We trust him with the outcome. See, Joseph wanted to trust in, in the cupbearer. and be like, man, I hope this guy remembers me. I imagine Joseph sitting in prison and, and every time that gate would open, he would rush to the gate and be like, oh, maybe this is the day. He finally remembered me only to, to, to be let down. Come to run into the gate again the next day when the gate opens again. It's like, oh, oh, nope, not for me. Continually let down. How defeating must that have felt for somebody like Joseph? And here we find, just like in the beginning of the chapter, just like in the beginning of the chapter, when it said sometime after this, Joseph gets put in an in-between. The sometime after this. Between this chapter and the next chapter, there's going to be two years. And God is working on Joseph the entire time. It's for a purpose. It's for a plan. Even when you don't understand the plan, even when you don't understand the purpose, even when people fail you, even when the church fails you, trust God with the outcome. And it starts by trusting him with the outcome of your life. Trusting him with the outcome of your salvation. You can't earn it. There's nothing you can do to earn salvation. It's through Jesus Christ alone. And we need to trust God that he's got us. How do you handle the in-between moments in life? How do you handle those moments when you're getting called into the manager's office at four o'clock on a Friday? See, that's what what happened to me. Four o'clock on a Friday, I got called into the manager's office. There's a management company working with the company I worked for at the time because our everything was in chaos and I wasn't very good at my job to be honest with you. In fact, that day that I got called into the manager's office, I was building a uh, uh, a, a, a red solo cup wall on my uh, on my uh, coworker's office door. He was out on a sales call doing actually work, uh, actual work, and and I was supposed to be doing actual work, but I thought I would do a prank instead, and so I was doing these red solo cups on his on his door, and uh, 
so I didn't have much of an argument when they told me they had to let me go. Uh, so I was like, but I worked so hard. Can't you tell by the road solo cups that you just interrupted me? I didn't finish the wall. Um, I, yeah, I didn't, I didn't finish that wall. But that little detour, that little delay, God used. That, that Friday at 4 o'clock, my life changed. I didn't know it at the time. I, I, I didn't know how to trust God with that outcome. I didn't know what I was going to do next. I, I remember coming, telling, calling my wife on the phone. I'm like, I, um, yeah, I don't have a job anymore. In the process of buying a house, I've shared this story before. and Like, what is God doing? And it was in that week that I realized that I needed to go into ministry. And it was from the person that actually fired me that we got together for coffee because uh, he wanted to help me out. And, and so he was like, what can we do to make, like, how, how can we, here, let's look at your resume and let's look at all this. And, and, and he was the one who said, why aren't you in full-time vocational ministry? I see what you're about. I see how you treat people. I see what you're doing why aren't you in full-time vocational ministry? And I said, well, I'm already serving at a church, and it's, uh, if I left, it would be awful because they wouldn't have anyone to do what I'm doing right now. And, and I remember he looked at me and he said, so what you're telling me is that <laughs> your position voluntarily at this church is too big for God to fill. That's what you're saying. <laughs> Sheepish. I'm like, oh, I, I guess you're right. I wasn't trusting God with the outcome of that church. I wasn't trusting God with the outcome of my life. Until that moment, I was like, I, I, I need to explore this. Now, it took some time. There are more delays and detours along the way to finally get to where I, I am today. And there's going to be more detours and delays in life. But the question is, am I going to trust God with the outcome? And the question for you is, are you going to trust God with the outcome? Whatever comes, whatever happens, God, I'm going to give you today. God, I pray for, for us today that we would trust you with the outcome of our lives. God, in these in-between, that those, those sometime after this moments, God, that we would trust you. It wouldn't just be lip service, but we would trust you with our lives. We would trust you with the actions of our lives. God, that our families and our relatives and our, our friends and our coworkers would see that we trust you for the outcome of our life and they would see a difference in us because of your son, Jesus. God, I pray that we commit to truth and use our spiritual gifts to serve others and serve you. Jesus, it's in your name, the only name worthy of praise, the only name in which we enter your kingdom. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for checking us out. We'll see you next time.